Joshua, how's it going today? Great, man. I'm glad we finally linked up. I'm glad. I'm glad. I mean, your story is crazy. Uh, you've got like I'm my favorite thing to do is to tell people's testimonies, like tell their stories, dive into like their pivot point moments that the moment they were living one way and like something happened and they they start living a different way. And your story is kind of like the epitome of that in every single way. And so, you know, you were a porn star for how long? How long were you in the uh, industry? So almost, almost six years, so a little over five years. So I was in the industry from 2006 until uh, like December of 2012. And you've shared your story in so many ways. The part of your story that I don't know as much about and that I'm really intrigued by is the moment you sort of made your decision to leave the industry. And what's interesting, yeah. it, it wasn't like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but in that moment, it wasn't like you found Jesus in that moment. Yeah. But you made I, this decision. So talk about I, that a little bit. I love that you asked me that because I've shared my story a ton of times. And I think like that is the aspect of my story that sometimes gets misconstrued that like this guy was a porn star. He found Jesus. He left and all of a sudden he's a pastor. Like that's... That's not how it happened whatsoever, and I love that you asked that. But um, just kind of back up to how I got to that point. Um, I went from uh, being someone who I had done a thousand movies. I had just won Performer of the Year, and you know it was the third time I was nominated for it, and I won Performer of the Year, and that was something that, like, at one point, you know, I was like, man, that would be amazing to do this, but yet. I'm winning performer of the year and my phone's going crazy. Uh, my PR person and my agent are calling me because I'm not there. I'm actually at home crying my eyes out on my face because I hate my life. And, and, so you, and I, can I just pause there for a minute? I, because you wanted this thing, right? You're in right. this industry and it probably sounds, it probably sounds foreign to some people, but the idea that it's almost like a Grammy or an Oscar in the adult film industry, right? Essentially. Right. Yeah. So that, and so you want this? Yeah. I mean that because I mean it it obviously like gives you you know affirmation for your accomplishments. But just like any other industry, if you win awards, then you know you are more prominent. You're more sought after. You end up getting more gigs. You can charge more for the things that you do. As far as like PR and things like that, you're you're more relevant. So you can you know your worth increases. So there's a lot of like you know things that you would think that I would be excited about, but yet I didn't even show up. And the last award of the night that was the biggest one, they're calling my name. And not only do they, like, not only am I not there, no one knows that I'm not there because everyone just assumed like he has to be in the building somewhere, but I wasn't there. And so you just, you were at home. You said you're crying your eyes that you hated your life. Why did you hate your life? Yeah, for me, the longer I was in the industry, the more shame I felt and the more guilt I felt. And I saw myself as a product that my only value was indicative of me being able to sell myself for some variation of a sex act. And I saw myself as not valuable as a son. I saw myself not valuable as a friend, not valuable as a big brother. So I started pushing myself away and I started isolating myself. Um, I started thinking, man, there's no way that even though these, my mom's telling me, I love you, you know, you come home or, or, you know, I, I, I like, I don't agree with what you're doing, but I, I'm not mad at you, you know, just reaching out to me, reaching out to me, reaching out to me. I'm just like, there's no way that she could want me. There's no way that I could. Because I, that's how I saw myself. I saw myself as dirty and used up and just someone to be ashamed of. So I isolated myself from everyone, and that was the catalyst for a very deep depression. And it was to the point where I didn't have any interaction with anyone that called me by my real name. So it had been almost a year when I walked in that bank. And I had to go in the bank because I didn't normally go in and deposit the checks because the checks have a memo of what it's for. And I was embarrassed. So I would always go to the ATM and deposit or I would just like put it in the, the slot or whatever. Um, I didn't want to look someone in the eye and say, here's this money from, you know, this prostitution I did. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to do that. So 
I, you know, I, I did everything I could to avoid it, but I couldn't avoid it this day. I bought, I deposit the check and normal interaction, you know, what I swipe my card, she enters in, you know, I enter in my pen so she can pull up my num my checking account number or whatever, put the check in. Thank you. Here's your receipt. Have a good day. I take the receipt. I pivot. I'm going to leave. And she says, Joshua, is there anything I can do for you? Josh, was there anything I can help you with? And it was it was it was weird because if it was the beginning of a conversation, it wouldn't made sense, but it made no sense. And I was like, why are you asking me that? Like I did I I didn't even say a word. I didn't say anything. I I just looked at her like, you know, deer in headlights, and I still get chills to this day, like thinking about it because it just shattered this plausible reality that I created. It shattered this fog that I was in and I go home and I remember I wash my hands I look at myself in the mirror and I lost it I lost it because in that moment I felt conviction for the first time I felt ashamed and I felt guilty but I never felt conviction and in that moment I felt it and it and it weighed a million pounds and it was crushing me and I couldn't think of anything more than my mom because my mom who had experienced so much loss and fought so hard for me in my life and did so much for me. She finally meets someone who treats her well and they get married. I wasn't there. Within months, his pancreas ruptures and he dies. I wasn't there. My mom needed me and I wasn't there because I was ashamed of myself. I was so selfish in my depression that I couldn't even see that my mom just needed me and it didn't matter about what I was doing but I saw myself as so useless that I didn't go so so can I stop you there because I know you have this moment right I mean that that is an interesting pivot point moment of you were so miserable with the way your life was it's kind of like building and building and building and this simple question from this bank teller Right. Is the thing that like pushes you over the edge into yeah. leaving it all behind. Right. And again, you didn't leave it all behind and become a Christian in that moment, but you right. left it all behind. I know you you went back to to you went back home, right? You went back to living yeah. a normal life essentially. Yeah. But what was that process like? How hard was that to it's do? Hard. Because I believed another lie. I believed the lie that if I wasn't doing that thing, I wouldn't feel the shame, the pain, the guilt. And I was naive enough to think that no one would find out. Like no one would know. Like I, I could like, yeah, people knew me on a regular basis, like in Hollywood and Vegas, but not in North Carolina, not in Raleigh, North Carolina. No one's gonna no one's gonna recognize me there. But I was wrong. I was wrong. So, you know, that moment happens, I I weep. I hurt and then I pick up my phone and I call my agent and I'm like, I'm I, I'm not showing up. He's like, Are you not feeling well? Like what's going on? I'm like, No, I quit. I'm done. Um, I call my PR guy, I'm like, put together, you know, a, a press release, I quit. And you know, I, I was under contract with a company and it's like he's like, You're gonna have to pay like X amount of dollars to get out of contract. I was like, I don't care. I don't care, I'm done. I'm never walking on a porn set ever again. I'm never doing this again. And I, wow. sub, I subleased my, my place I was living in and I just pretty much, I took my clothes and I, I ran home to my mom and like, we had this amazing like embrace at, at the airport. And, um, it was crazy because like, I realized in that moment she could care less what I was doing. Like, I mean, she cared, but like that didn't impact how much she loved me. I never stopped being her son. So she just wanted you back. She wanted you right. back in relationship with her. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I had some experience, like I grew up like playing sports and I had a little bit of experience, like personal training, like here and there. I just loved like strength conditioning in there and like CrossFit was like really booming. And I dabbled in that. So just because it was this new age thing that, it, that it, you know, it, the, uh, you know the, the movement had tr like really began in California, so that that just 
allowed me to have some like notoriety in some degree. It's like, hey, this guy is from California and he has some experience with CrossFit. So that has value at a gym. And it's pretty much how I got the job. It's like, I don't have a lot of experience, but here's where I was and I was doing it here. Um, and so it was like, okay, here's, you know, you can work 20 hours a week for, you know, like 25 bucks an hour. And I was like, oh, how am I going to live off of that? You know, because like I was, you know, I was making, you know, I made well over a million dollars the, you know, the time I was in the industry, you know, so I was making high six figures. So I was just like, what am I going to do with this? So I had to get another job. So I, I worked at Whole Foods as well. So I worked at Whole Foods from 4 a.m. until 1. And then I worked at the gym from 2 until 8.30, except on the days that I had off from Whole Foods. And I worked all day at the gym wow. there. Wow. And while I was there, uh, these owners at this gym, they said, you know, they're like, everything sounds great. And maybe three days go by and I get pulled in their office and they're like, um, was there something you wanted to tell us about yourself? How do you, let me ask you this. Cause so in that moment, and I can't even imagine like the heart sinking and what here you are, you tried to leave it behind. Yeah. You've tried to start over and you probably in the back of your mind had that fear. You, you know, you knew, you thought, okay, they're not going to find out, but yeah, you, know, you probably thought if somebody finds out, it's not going to be good. What are right. you feeling in those moments when they're asking you that question? Yeah. It's like, man, like I, I can't, I'll never get away from this. Like it's still who I am. Um, but in that moment they could have said you were, you were not transparent enough. Take a hike. Instead they said, Hey, we want to set some healthy boundaries for you. And the person that we see sitting in front of us, we see the potential that you have, but we also see the hurt that you're carrying and we want to help you. So that they were they Christians? Were no. they Christians? Yeah. Or were they believers? Oh, interesting. Amaz so it's uh, amazingly, it was a it was a lesbian couple that owned the gym. Just amazing, amazing, amazing people. And so they they gave me you know they gave me a chance when they could have very easily not. And I worked there for a while, and then a bigger gym uh, or different gym in in the same town, like someone left to open their own gym and they had a vacancy for a head coach and I applied for that and I got that job and like at that job it's like then all of a sudden I was making enough money I was doing well enough for myself where I didn't have to work at Whole Foods anymore so like I was making progress but at the same time I continued to lie to people like when I would meet people out and about you know tell me about yourself well I used to live in California but you know, I, I, I went out there to act a model and it didn't work out, but you know, here I am. Like, How long did you live there? I'm like, well, about seven, seven years. I'm like, wow, that was a long time. What were you doing there? I ah, just, you know, whatever. You know? It's not an easy thing to tell. I mean, it's right. not an easy thing to tell people. And so I would imagine you had a lot of other people who recognized you along the way as yeah, well. I mean, everywhere I went, like at, at Whole Foods, like day one, like the entire, like, team that like worked in the like the like butcher area they're like we like you're you know they call me by my stage name they're like you're that guy and then you're that guy and then sometimes customers would say hey weird question are you this person and i was just like man i just can't get away from this was that but, embarrassing i mean i would imagine it was embarrassing for you in that moment humiliating yeah. humiliating i remember being at my brother's college graduation and several people recognizing me and like they thought it was cool at the time and i and i played it off you know like oh awesome you know who i am but like just humiliated yeah internally like, you're th can i can i ask you a related question to this because now and i want to talk about why you decided to speak out but you know you live we live in a world where things on social media, things on video and the internet, they last forever. And so right. this is still, these are still things I would imagine that are active and out there still. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so how for you, and even when somebody like what you're doing speaks out, I know there are times that people in the industry try to manipulate that and use it again to repush things. How do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Now? I, mean, I mean, that's tough because you know, it, like one of the things, like when I got, like when I moved to North Carolina, like the very first thing I did. So I used to have 
ironically, I had a cross tattooed on my arm. And I got it covered up. I got that covered up because I was like, that way, you know, someone's like, hey, you might have seen that, but you won't find this on my arm anywhere online. You know, it's like, so here's this tangible thing. It's like, I'm not doing that anymore. I can prove it. Um, and like for me, that that was, man, it was a, it was another like Genesis 3 moment for me where it's like, man, if I, co- if I can cover this up with fig leaves, no one's going to know. I can hide. <laughs> You know, because you had it the whole time. You had that cross the whole time you were, you know, yeah, you were performing, cross, right? The whole time you were working. Yeah, I mean, I I got that cross. I was like, man, Justin Timberlake has it, so I gotta have it. You know, that, like, most people are like, man, well, you you must have grew up like Christian and this and that. I'm like, I I knew a lot about God. I knew about God. I believed that um, God, you know, created everything. I believe that time, space, and matter. Um, it came into existence at the same time, and there had to be an intelligent designer outside of those things to initiate that. So I believed in that aspect, but like, I never grasped the concept that he wanted to know me. How do you? So how do you deal? And it, that's interesting, by the way, that what you just said, because a lot of people walk around, and it just sort of goes to show you that's not what Christian. There's a lot of nominal Christianity, right? People. Right who say, I believe these things, but until it connects to the core of it, you know, you're not really living that, living that life. And it's not bleeding through in everything you do. How do you, how do you deal with that reality still just to kind of piggyback off of that other question of this being something, I mean, it's interesting because you're open about it and you're talking about it now and you, and I want to talk about that next. You made that decision, but how do you deal with that when it comes across in a negative sense or people bring up, or just again, the knowledge that that stuff is still out there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a great invitation to talk about that we are all broken. Like, I get to talk about like Romans three twenty three. It's like, hey, we all fall short of the glory of God. So no one is perfect, and our neutral is to do the sinful thing, to do the prideful thing, to do the selfish thing, to make the wrong decision. That's our neutral. So we gravitate towards that. And if you check out the Bible, because you should you should read the Bible because it's pretty cool. There's tons of stories about incredibly broken people that God saw and he restored and he used them to make an impact for his name. I was like, so like, yes, I did these things, but I want you to know that your worst mistake, that doesn't define who you are. Your greatest accomplishment, that doesn't define who you are. God defines who you are because he made you and he made you with a plan and purpose and he gave you gifts and talents to execute that purpose. And if you know him, you'll answer that question that many people wrestle with late at night. Why am I here? In the in a world of 7 billion people, why am I here? Why does my life matter? What am I supposed to do? Well, I was, I was going to say, not sorry to interrupt you, but I'm just, I'm listening to you say this. And I remember in some of the interviews you did, you said things like, you know, at one point, you know, when you were in the industry, you were thinking, no one's going to ever want to marry me. No one's going to ever want, like, what am I going to do with my life? You felt worthless. And here you are now. You're a father, you're a husband, you are a pastor. You, you know, God, like what you were just saying, has redeemed all these things that you thought were never possible. And I think it's just such a testament and a testimony for people who are looking at their life and they're like, I've made such a mess of my life. There's no yep. hope for me. There's nothing that God that can ever happen good for me. And you're like, just like you were saying, you're sharing your story and you're showing like that's not true. Like, God, you, if you let God, do with your life what he wants, then incredible things can happen. Yeah. I mean, we, we connect with people through our weaknesses, you know? So like, that's why Jesus told parables. People understand stories because they can see themselves in some capacity within that story. If you, you know, it, based on the context, you know? Um, so for me, like I am vulnerable as I am because everybody carries something. Like almost everyone I've ever met has some kind of blockade in their life. And it comes from the way that they see themselves because of a hurt, a failure, a disappointment. Um, Maybe it was self-inflicted like I did. Um, Maybe someone else hurt you. But you carry that with you and you limit how you see yourself and what you can do and how you can receive love and what you can accomplish and how talented you are and the things that you could do in life because of that that thing that happened 
it changes your perspective of who you are. And that mm, is what I'm most is, passionate yeah. about. That's I'm powerful. Passionate about, hey, like you do not have to be your own worst enemy. You don't have to stand in your own way. And that's often what we do. And that's a and that's not a you know that's not an instantaneous you know decision. That's a daily decision. Yeah, you got to do it every day. I mean, all of the relationship that we have with Jesus is a daily thing. I think we, yeah. I think in a lot of places in this country, we've kind of convinced ourselves that it's like you say the prayer and you're done. Like you said right. the prayer, you've accepted Jesus, and it's like, well, it's a whole process. And like you look at Ephesians six, and you look at just like the battle over good and evil that we know is going on. And yeah, I mean. We'll talk about this in another podcast, but like just the spiritual warfare aspect of yeah. all of these things, you know, when you don't live that way and realize that, it's really yeah. easy to end up somewhere you didn't mean to be and somewhere God didn't mean for you to be, right? And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, like, what made, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, it's like, man, so I, I go from, you know, seeing myself that way and lying to people. And then, you know, that goes on for almost two years. And then, I, I, I had this interaction with this girl and she, you know, she's working out at the gym that I'm working at and she just finished the workout. And I was like, Hey, you know, I'm going to, I'll put your equipment away for you. She's like, get out of here. I can put my own stuff away. I was like, I'm in love. I'm in love. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> I was like, and then like I asked her, I was like, Hey, can we go out for a date? She's like, we can go out for a run. I was like, Okay. She's giving you a run for your money here. Yeah. Like she was giving you a run for your money. Yeah. She wasn't just like, yeah. yeah. I mean, met, I've never met anyone like her. And I was like, man, okay. And then we go, we, we I'm going to meet her and we're going to go for a run on this trail. And um, I'm sitting there waiting on her to come out of her apartment. And I just like feel this weight of like, you've hurt so many people because you were not honest. Just tell her. And I was like, I don't want to. <laughs> and this is like a stranger at this point, right? Yeah. I mean, like you're about yeah. to uh, unveil. Yeah, is I mean, she the first I, person I you helped her in, in in class? You know, I've helped her like execute like weightlifting and like gymnastic components and things like that. But like, you have not put her equipment away though. You have not put her stuff no, away because she was not no, going to let you do that. She wasn't but... having that. <laughs> she wasn't having that. <laughs> but yeah, man, I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I gotta tell her. So. As we go to go to this run that ended up being a walk, um, I was like, I got to I got to tell you something. And I unloaded years of suppressed emotions. And I was just like, hey, let me tell you how bad I am. Let me tell you how unworthy I am of being in your presence. Let me just tell you, like, how bad I am. And she she very like she patiently listened. She didn't say anything while I was talking. And then when I stopped, she was like, "Okay, well, can I ask you something?" I was like, "Sure." She said, "Do you know who God is?" I was like, "You know, the, the what I said." I was like, "Yeah, I, I believe that you know God created everything, created me, and you know, yeah, sure." Um, she's like, "Well, do you know him? Like, do you have a relationship with him?" I was like, "What do you mean?" And it, it was almost like I, I love like thinking about like Colossians four six like let your speech be gracious and season with salt so that you might know how you you ought to answer each person. It's like she showed me grace in that moment. She showed me honor in that moment. She elevated me and she ushered me into the presence of God without saying a word, without condemning me, with by extending grace to me. And I was I was wow I don't know. But it may it created this like healthy skepticism in me. It's like I don't know if I have I don't I don't think I do have a I don't know I don't I don't know the answer to that. And we didn't talk much more about that. But she asked me questions about you know my family, about how I grew up, about like what am I what am I interested in? And at the end of the conversation, she's like, you know, I I just want you to know like you may like yes, all those things about you may have been true. But that's not who you are. That's not the person I see standing in front of me. The person in front of me values people. They're a very educated coach. Like, you're good at what you do. You care about your mom. I love that about you. And it's like, she started, like, speaking life into me. And, I, and honestly, it had never, like, happened in a way where I could receive it. But she almost, like, broke down these boundaries that I put up against myself. 
And we had that conversation. And then a week later, we I'm like, man, I, I got to know more. Like, So we decided collectively to go to church. We went to a church and I heard the gospel and it absolutely leveled me. But what it did is it took off the weight that I've been carrying, not from my time in porn, my entire life. And I surrendered wow. that shame and guilt. And yeah, so like that, like that was the moment like that absolutely changed my life. But even in that, it was a process, like something that I talk about really often. So um, 2 Timothy 3, 16, you know, all scripture is God breathed and good for teaching, rebuking and all these things. But this word reproof, like that's what I had to do. So reproof ultimately means God wants to destroy and demolish the idea that you know who you are. You know who God is and you know how you are supposed to interact with people. And he wants to rebuild you in a foundation that is his truth. Because I had seen myself for so long through the eyes of my failure, my pain, my not being good enough. And then I treated people through my experiences. I, you know, sex was transactional and people were products. That's how I saw myself. And I wasn't good at relationships. I was a bad friend. I didn't show up when I said I would be there. I didn't have integrity. I didn't have all these things. And it was, I had to lay aside everything that I believed about myself and rebuild myself utilizing God's truth. And as he healed me, like absolutely there were bumps and bruises along the way and it was hard. But what I love is, so my, that person is now my wife, you know, and, (laughs) um, she was with me every step of the way. And when we, when we stand in front of, um, you know, so we did a premarital class and, you know, we, we said, Hey, we want to take, um, a vow of celibacy, like really like lean into purity. And it's like a guy that had done a thousand pornography scenes to say, I'm going to be celibate before marriage. That's ridiculous. And, and again, like that's something I love to talk about. And like second Corinthians five seventeen is real. That person is dead. I don't know that guy. Like, you're yeah, new, yeah can, you're a new creation. I yeah. can. Yeah, like, absolutely. I can glean some of the experiences that I had in my life, you know, with, you know, I, you know, got better at communicating. Obviously I got very comfortable being on camera. It's like, um, like things like that. It's like, you know, understanding production and editing and all of that stuff. Like those are things I glean from that, but that person is dead. And you, can I ask you, can I ask you a question about that? You know, how hard is it to, did you ever have moments where you feel knocked down again, right? Because of the, the level of the, I mean, you overcame it, you moved on from it, but I think just all of us, the past can still come back at moments to kind of get you. Like, do you ever have those moments and how do you deal with them if you do? Yeah. I mean, it, I do, but it happens in waves. You know, it's like, for me, it's like, I get a lot of hate and I get a lot. Right. Like, yeah. I, but most of the hate is I can't comprehend if, if I am in the middle of lust and being addicted to pornography, how are you going to tell me that was you were in the middle of it and you were at the pinnacle of your career? How are you going to tell me that you were miserable? Like, what am I supposed to do with that? I don't like that because you're telling me that thing that I love isn't real and it's not good for me. I don't like that. So I get a lot of pushback in that regard. And I mean, sometimes it's just really vile. Like, the day that we found out that our firstborn, we, we announced that he was a boy, someone hacked my Facebook and sent pornographic images to all 4,000 of my friends. Took the time to send 4,000 individual pictures to every single person on our friends list. And that included my wife's family, her mom, her sister, her cousins. Um, everyone that it was at my gym, they posted pictures like on, uh, my wow. gym's like, you know, page. Um, so like, like, how do I respond to that? You know, it's like, 
it's it sucks. Like, how do I respond to like when people get angry that I did that? They're like, well, what are you gonna tell your kids? You know, what are you gonna do when your kids see that? And it's like, I mean, I'm still human. So like, when people say that to me, like, my first instinct is like, well, I kind of want to break your arm right now, you know? <laughs> but <laughs> well, it's painful. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it, this is yeah. it's it's painful. And I you know, I think like you know, for people who are listening who might not be Christians, this may sound strange, but for Christians, you'll understand like it's, it's the enemy. I mean, the enemy finds ways to get to yeah. you, right. And to get yeah. to you. And, and sometimes it's things that other people are doing. How, when that happened, well, first of all, when you said, you know, like your wife's sister and the family, I mean, yeah. one of the questions I, I had for you, and this is, it's related to this. You told her when you didn't, you barely knew her as you were starting to get to know her, yeah. obviously you're going to have a family. Was it hard to have those conversations with family too, you know, with in-laws with, I mean, I can't imagine how painful and tough that was. It was, it was really crazy. It, like I was, I was bombarded with absolute acceptance and grace because all of her family, you know, they, they were Christian and her family was like very tight knit, very loving and very supportive. Um, so it, it was encouraging to me and it was, I don't know. I think what allowed me to deal with it was like everyone that I thought would have been like humiliated and angry and, and just like, I can't believe this. Don't worry about that. That's because their pain, is, their pain is not about you. Like, see, that's a lesson though. That's a lesson. For, for all of us, because it, it's so easy to go first to, oh, you really shouldn't have done that. You know, like that yeah. the condemning. And and she didn't do that when you talked to her. Her family didn't do that. And right. I think as Christians, we can forget. We can forget that people change. That Like that's yeah. what Christianity is. Like yeah. it's change, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what the conversation – because like I know for a fact just knowing – like I don't know the answer to that, this question definitively – but I feel confident knowing my wife well as I do. We had that conversation. And as soon as she was out of my presence, she was on the phone with her mom telling her that. And <laughs> like, and like, it wasn't something that like she hid under the rug and it popped up. Like I like for sure. I know that her mom, like, no, like she knew it's like before, like she had time to like, I'm like, what if she finds out? She's like, Oh, you know, I already told her. So I mean, that, that was good, but still it's like, it hurt, it hurt bad. But then it's like, okay, what am I going to do? And it's like, that's like what you're talking about. Like in life, it's like either you can be reactionary or you can be responsive. And I, I love uh, a, a mentor of mine always says, uh, everything deserves a response. Not everything deserves a reaction. So reactionary behavior is, you know, this situation or this person does something or something happens to me and my emotional reaction is indicative of what happened to me. Responsive reaction is based on who I am at a foundational level. Like I have an underlining why that impacts my what. Regardless of what happens to me, my why remains the same. So it's like who I am is not defined by anything that happens to me or what someone else says to me. And sometimes the most loving thing that you can do for yourself and the other person is not respond. Yeah. I have, I have a 15 second rule. I was talking about this um, yesterday at a conference and I'm just like, if I'm going to write something on Twitter, for instance, I'm going to write it and I'm going to pause and I'm going to be like, is this something that is going, and I haven't always done this and I don't always do it well now, but I yeah. try. Is this something that's going to be helpful? Is it going to point people toward Christ or away from Christ? And right. then I'll delete it if not. And so yeah. I think in life, that's not just on Twitter. That's good yeah. across the board to th come up with a thought. Yeah. Think about it before you say it. And maybe you don't need to say it. Yeah. Right? And, and like, I think that like for me, like I was blessed in that aspect, but man, my mentor. So I met this guy, Andrew. And so I'm, you probably know this by now, like I'm a little bit out there. I'm a little bit crazy. And I, like I, anything that I love, I'm just so passionate about. So whatever I'm doing, good or bad, 
whatever I'm doing, I'm all in and I'm going to give it everything I, de- I have. Cause those are the, like, those are things that in, my mother instilled in me work ethic and loving people. Like you will love every single person you meet and you will treat them with respect and you will work incredibly hard regardless of what you're doing. Whether, you know, I'm spreading pine needles when I was 16 or if I was, you know, working in the grocery store, like whatever it is, give it your best. Work hard because that's who you are. That's not like it doesn't matter what it is. That's who you are. So I'm like, OK, um, I, how, how is that going to impact my life? And it's just, it's, it's just, you know, it was, it was a, it was a learning curve. So that, I mean, that's why I say that to say, it's like, man, as I was going through my life, like, I didn't always get it right. I made lots of mistakes, you know? And it's like, I, I, I walk into, um, this, this church and, um, I just, like, I just gave my life to Christ. Like on a Sunday, I walk into this church on a Tuesday. I'm like, Hey, is there anyone here I can talk to? And, um, they're like, actually the executive pastor is available his name's gary vet i was like cool um i was like gary can i talk to you he's like yeah, absolutely sit down and i and i tell him this my story he's like wow <laughs> he's like that's wild and i was like i was like so um he, he's very systematic like the wisest man i've ever met but he's like he's like so what so now what like what's your goal like what do you want to do i was like well i feel like god is like giving me this story that really isn't mine it's his but I feel burdened to do something with it. It's like, I feel like I want to build an ark. Like, I feel like I need to construct something that is bigger than I could ever do by myself and far beyond anything that's my capabilities. And I was like, I want to be a capable of doing the thing that God has called me to do. He's like, man, I want to introduce you to someone. And he walks me next door to another office. And there's this guy, Andrew, that he uh, pretty recently graduated from DTS, from Dallas Theological Seminary. And he and his wife had moved from Texas to Raleigh, and he was going to be working at um, a, another campus that they were launching. And he didn't have a ton of stuff going on in that moment. And he's like, hey, yeah, let's hang out. And we had, I remember he set a muffin in front of me. He's like, I want you to, like the first time we met, not like literally the first time we met, the first time like we scheduled a meeting, he set a muffin in front of me. He's like, hey, I want you to tell me a hundred things about this muffin. I was like, this guy's nuts. <laughs> yeah. but, but, he, but he pushed me. He's like, tell me a hundred things about it. So after I told him a hundred things about it, he's like, that's how we're going to look at the Bible. He's like, I, I want you to know what it says before we talk about what it means. So we're going to dig into it. Like, what is it? What is being said? So he taught me how to read the Bible. He taught me about context. He taught me about, you know, commentaries. He taught me about all this stuff um, about like, the, you know, the, the different styles of writing that was in the Bible. And then he taught me how to teach the Bible systematically to other people. And then we, we spent a year, like we were meeting together three, four times a week. Um, like any spare time he had, I was there. I was like, you know, I wouldn't go away. <laughs> and uh, we spent a year, we went through like, we went through Greek. And he, like we, we spent a year on the book of John in Greek to the point where I could read it and I could write it and I could, you know, I could dig into it. Wow. And then like that just made me because his, the way he worships is through like exegesis, like through like going through the Bible, picking it apart and finding like deep theological truth. And like, that's the way he worships. And I love this man with every fiber of my being. So it's like, man, I respect you so much. It's like, you've taught me to love this too. So that's when, you know, I decided to go back to Liberty University and, you know, study, you know, Christian ministries. And my, my plan is, you know, to, to get my master's in divinity. But it's like, that's what, like, that's become the way I worship as well. Like, not not exclusively, but that is a type of worship for me. So just kind of crazy in that, you know, hey, throw me in the game. And I had this person to walk with me step by step by step in like, and he, like, something I talk about really often is, like, accountability. Like, he kept me accountable because, like, I was, like, me and him, we had a, like, <laughs> this is this is still to this day, like, one of my best friends in the world. And it's like, if I did something stupid, w- like, without hesitation, he knew. I was like, hey, I said this. <laughs> is that, like, should I? He's like, <laughs> No. <laughs> it's like, no. accountability. I mean, yeah, it's accountability, though, right? Like, we all need yeah. that. 
And it's like, for me, like I was going through like such like, I mean, obviously I, I like grew in my faith at an exponential rate because I spent, I'm talking like 15 to 20 hours a week, like him just pouring into my life. Like not only like him, you know, teaching me theological truth, but like practically it's like, man, the way that you're doing this, um, you know, like Am I exuding excellence in the way I coach? Like, are you utilizing like the relationship you have with the people in the gym? Like, are you talking about Jesus when you have the opportunity to? Are you talking about Jesus in in a time where maybe um, maybe it's not you know the most opportune? Like, you just like just teaching me this like balance walk, and then I you know I was like a ping pong ball. You know, I was like all, I was all over the place, but he just kind of you know kept you know spurring me along. And man, like I am the pastor that I am today and I have the theological understanding that I do today. I mean, yes, I put in the reps. Yes, I put in the work. But man, his yes to just pour into my life, like absolutely transformed me. And like that combined with I never I I never been able to receive love. So what I was experiencing from hope, I was experiencing love for the first time. I'd experienced a lot of lust, but lust takes, love gives. And she wasn't asking anything, you know, she wasn't trying to take anything from me. She was trying to give me everything. And I, it, it's, well, and, it's in my nature. And then he her. was too. Yeah. yeah so he's like, doing that too. So you, you're talking about like, this is like pouring into people, right? I mean, this is, it's such an important thing. And so that brings me to, I always loved, I love to put people on the spot with a 30 second elevator pitch, but you're not really on that spot. Use as much time as you want, but but my final kind of question, and we're going to do a part two of this, by the way. Like yeah. This is kind of a great way for us to dive into this. But my final question for you, in light of what you just talked about, the pouring in, what are you hoping to do with your story? What message are you hoping to send? What's sort of your elevator pitch to people of your like your testimony and what you're hoping that pours into others? Yeah, I mean, it. That's tough. That's tough because I have a lot of a lot of goals and a lot of like big dreams and visions. But for me, my hope is to share my story and someone to be in the middle of a place where they believe that there's nowhere out. There's no way out. And they see themselves as invaluable because of something that happened to them or something that they chose to do willingly. And they don't see a future outside of or at all because of that thing. And I want to share that healing is possible. Jesus is real. And his love is transformative. And you are not your past. You are not your mistakes. That's not who you are. You are a person. You have intrinsic value. Your life is important. And you are worth getting up, dusting yourself off, and if you're doing something that you are not proud of at the end of the day, you have the capacity and the ability to do something else. That is solid. That that was actually a perfect 30 second elevator pitch, actually. Just, <laughs> it was very <laughs> I mean, condensed. Like, systematic communication under a time constraint. It's like I was, you know, I had the opportunity to work at Life Church and man. Uh, they don't mess around. They don't mess around. It's like, no, they I'm, don't mess around Andrew, over there. Like, they don't fed me and fed me and fed me. And then, you know, that when I was at live church, it, it was, we were running fast and we we're running hard and, you know, their level of excellence when it comes to communication, especially, um, like that, like that was the two things I would say, like, what did I take away from my time at live church? Being able to communicate well in a concise and clear way. and appreciating systems and be able to execute them to reach an astronomical amount of people. Because most people are like systems, nah, give me people, man. If you utilize systems well, you can reach more people. And if you empower people to do the thing that you can't do, that God had created them to do, all of a sudden you're not doing addition anymore. You're, you're working with multiplication. So it was like good, good discipleship, you know? I love that. Well, listen, there's going to be a part two of this if you're willing. Are you willing to come back for a part two? I'm willing. Two? And it's like, man, yeah, I, I probably need to wear like some kind of like ankle like shock thing to like, I will talk 
all day long. COVID messed me up, man. No, as but see, I like that. As an extrovert, I like man, that. I need people, I need conversations. So it's like, man, um, and I'm passionate about my story and I'm passionate about people. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely.